their passion for God begins to wane, and before you know it, they end up in idolatry. They're worshiping other gods, not the true God, but worshiping all these other gods that are in these other lands. And so what happens is God is displeased, and so He kind of pulls back His favor, and they end up in slavery. They're enslaved to their sin. You would think that somewhere along the line they would figure this out and say, you know, this is not a good thing. And they do. Because at some point along, whether it's seven years, 10 years, 15 years, amount of years, they, they cry out to God and they repent. And they ask for forgiveness and they want to go the right way. They want to get back to God. And so they, they, they reach out and they cry out to God and God gives them a deliverer. The next part of that is deliverance. And God has been raising up one person after the other. We've looked at a, a number of these different uh, 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 judges. And God raises them up to save the nation of Israel. And so they continue in this cycle over and over and over again. And as we look upon it, as we've looked at His Word, we're thinking, how stupid are these Israelites? Why would they continue in this cycle? Can't they figure this out? The truth is, the pattern is the same for some of you. You want to follow God, but you fall into this sin and you're consumed with satisfying your own selfish desire, satisfying your own flesh, and God allows that sin to enslave you. And there you are in slavery until you cry out and you repent, and this miraculous, awesome God delivers you. He takes you out of that sin. He forgives you of that sin, sets you back as righteous before Him. You begin to serve Him again. And then as it starts to wane away and the world begins to come back in, the cycle repeats. Some of you are in that cycle. And the thought that I believe that you are having is you're saying, is there any hope for me? I'm doing exactly what the Israelites said. It just doesn't seem that I could break the cycle. Is there any hope for me? Maybe that sounds like you. Maybe you're ready to throw your hands up in despair. You were ready to give up. I'm here this morning to declare to you. I'm here to tell you that there is hope, there is victory, there is triumph for those who are willing to trust in the power of God unto salvation. God has the power to change that cycle in your life. You don't have to live that way. I believe that not only God has the power to save us, but he also has the power to help us live a life that is holy and pleasing to him. There's hope for those who are willing to say, yes, Lord, yes. And so what I want to do this morning is examine the story of Samson. Samson. We're going to begin in chapter 13, if you have your Bibles, chapter 13. And I know all that group over there that's looking at their phones right now, that's Bible app that they're looking at, I'm pretty sure. There's one. Yeah, should I make them hold them up and show me? Yeah. Yeah, good deal. All right. <laughs> they might do it this morning. Because <laughs> I might come over there and check you guys out. I've been watching this group over here, these teens, right? You got your Bible? Okay, they're, 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 okay I'm, I'm impressed. Awesome. All right. This is a good story. Samson chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, he says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for how long? Forty years. So once again, we see the cycle. This time it's the Philistines, and it's going to be for 40 years. Verse 2, a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife 
who was childless, childless, unable to give birth. I always get a kick out of this. They always mention the man's name. Anybody know Samson's mom's name? You're making it up if you know, because I, don't, I haven't been able to find it. Mom, okay, yeah. <laughs> Is that what you said back there? All right. Mm-hmm. It's going to go like that today, all right. That's good. Verse 3, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. So let's just stop there for a moment. Here's what I want you to see. God is going to raise up Samson to deliver Israel. But there's something missing between verses 1 and 2 that has been the pattern. This particular time, there's no mention of repentance by the nation of Israel. Between verses 1 and 2, they're in captivity. God has turned them over to the, the, the Philistines for 40 years. But then in verse 2, it automatically goes to this idea that God is going to provide a deliverer. And there's no mention of repentance. And I don't know about you, but if there's a cycle going on and it's repeated over and over, I say, why? What's going on here? God, why did you change the cycle? What are you trying to tell us here? What's different about this time? Here's the answer. God is revealing His grace. He's revealing His love. He's revealing His mercy. In these verses, God brings deliverance. He brings His salvation to a people who are not crying out in repentance. Why? The Israelites aren't righteous. They aren't holy. There's nothing good in and of themselves. They are a people with no hope and no prospects in themselves. They keep repeating this cycle over and over, and they cannot break out of it. And yet God provides them once again a deliverer. This is the gospel. I believe that God is trying to show us the God that who He truly is, that He is at just the right time, that He would provide someone a perfect sacrifice. His name is Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. We didn't want to have... That's what, Yeah, I, I agree with that. We didn't want to have... You understand, you didn't, have, you didn't want to have anything to do with God when you were a sinner. You weren't attracted to Him. You know what you were attracted to? Sin. Sin is attractive. It's fun for a season. And yet God in His mercy and love and grace extended to you the plan of salvation that Christ would die on a cross on your behalf. He would take the punishment for your sin and you didn't want to have anything to do with Him. That is an amazing, awesome God, I'll just tell you this morning. And I believe that God is even revealing Himself in the Old Testament, in the book of Samson here, as Samson is being shown here. Uh, he wants us to understand how wonderful a God He is. You understand that God doesn't love the lovely. He makes those He loves lovely. He doesn't save the strong. He makes strong those who He saves. He doesn't save the righteous. He makes righteous those that He saves. That is the God that you and I know. That is the God that we serve. That is the God who is reaching out to those who have not known or do not know Him today right now. He is offering that to you even though you don't even want it. That means no matter who you are, no matter what circumstances you're in, whatever mistakes you have made, however weak you are, there's hope for you. There's hope for you, but that hope will not be found in your own strength. It is only found by receiving God's gift of grace. Do you believe that this morning? God wants to offer that to you this morning. 
Understanding that the power to live a holy life comes from the source of all power. And his name, I'll introduce you to him this morning. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the one who created all things. Everything is under his control. He has the power for to do whatever he chooses to do in this world. And the amazing thing is that he was willing to come to this world and die on a cross on our behalf that we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Back to the story. Verse 4. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. Verse 5. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Okay. So this is kind of cool. The angel of this, the angel of the Lord comes, and he comes to Samson's mom, who we don't know her name, Manoah's wife, and he says, "You're going to have a son. He's going to be dedicated. He's going to be set a, set apart to God." And then the angel begins to give her some instructions. Number one, he says, "This is called the Nazarite vow." Okay, you can walk out of here and surprise somebody. You know what the Nazarite vow is? No? Oh, let me just tell you. All right. Number one, you can't cut your hair. And every time I think when I read this story, I better not pick on it this morning. Don't cut your hair is what the rule is. It says the head is never to be touched by a razor. Number two, no alcohol. Drink no wine or other fermented drink. And number three, don't touch or eat anything unclean. And what they're talking about there is that you would not touch a dead body. That's unclean. You wouldn't touch a leper. That's unclean. And so he's got these three rules. And Samson is to obey this. He is to do this from birth. Samson has been set apart. He is pure and holy to God. For what purpose? It says Samson is to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And so let's read on. Manoah's wife goes to uh, him and tells him the whole story. Manoah is not quite sure about this, so he begins to pray to God. The God, God sends the angel back, and Manoah starts to ask the angel a bunch of questions. We pick it up in verse 12. It says, So Manoah asked him, When your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? So he begins to ask questions. He wants to know what's going to happen in the future. Verse 17, he asked another question. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? So what's, what's happening here with these verses? God is revealing himself to Manoah. He's revealing himself to Manoah and his wife, and they have encountered an angel of the Lord. How many of you have had an encounter with the angel of the Lord? Nobody? Oh, okay. Me neither. I think if it happened, it would be kind of exciting. I think my focus would kind of be on the angel. I don't know that I'd be asking a whole lot of questions. Maybe I would. I don't think so. But they've had this encounter with the angel of the Lord, and in the midst of this amazing encounter with God, Manoah wants more information. He wants more details. He wants more data so he can process all of this information. Instead of being in awe of God revealing himself, Manoah wants to know what's going to happen in the future. How do you think God's going to handle that? Here's his response, verse 18. He replied, why do you ask my name? And I love this. It is beyond understanding. Manoah wants details, he wants info, he wants data. He says, what's your name? And God says, it's beyond your understanding. And what is he talking about? Well, the truth is we do the same thing. Come on. God reveals himself to us. He is revealing to us. He is speaking to us through his word, 
through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, each and every day. When you woke up this morning and you had the life of breath in you, God was revealing himself to you. You got to have another day. You got to go out and see the beautiful sun this morning. God is re revealing himself through creation. He is talking to us every single day, revealing himself to us. He gives us directions. He gives us purpose. And you know what our response is? We want more details. We want more information. Think about this. We have the audacity to question God. Let me show you. For some reason, we as Christians think our life is supposed to go perfect. It doesn't. Anybody here, life gone perfect from day one? It doesn't happen that way, does it? We go through struggles. We go through some hard, hard times. And our first reaction when we go to God, is what? Why? Why do I have to go through this, God? Why does this have to happen to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? And we ask that question Because we don't understand who God is. If we had a true conception, a, a true knowledge of who this omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty God truly is, I don't think we would be so quick to walk up to Him in prayer and say, Why, God? I don't think you, I don't think you quite got this one right. I don't understand why I have to suffer. And I'm looking around and I see a lot of, I, I, I've been with you. I know, I know the pain. I've been in the hospital, I don't know how many times, at your bedside. I've been to the funeral home too many times. I know the struggles that you have. And we're just like Manoah. What's your name, God? It's beyond your understanding. You really think you're as smart as God this morning? You're not. Not if you've got a concept of the true God. And we're willing to, we're willing to go to Him. It, and it, what's amazing to me is that God's okay with that idea. He's okay with you going to Him and saying, Why, God? He understands the pain that you're going through. He understands the struggle that you're going through. He is able to just go and, and just listen to you and speak to him in such a way that is probably very rude. It doesn't bother him. But he desperately wants you to move forward from that question, to ask the question, God, what are you trying to show me here? What are you trying to reveal about yourself today through my struggle? And I'll tell you, we have an awesome God. His love is unconditional. It's available to anybody who wants it. And it never runs out. It's a well of living water. It's awesome. You think about this for just a minute. I don't know where I got these numbers. God created the sun. He spoke the sun. He spoke the universe, but I'm just going to take one little star, if you will. He spoke the sun into existence, our sun. There are millions of other suns in the, in, in the universe, much less probably the galaxy. I didn't count them all. But our one little sun in this little galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, out of many galaxies, one little sun, our little sun, 
generates enough energy in one second to give us enough power to run everything on this world for 13 billion years. And I don't like the billion years thing, but that's what I found. I don't think we're that old, number one, but we'll figure that out. You think about that. One, God created our son, which we think is very large. It's nothing to him. There's more power in that. Can you imagine the power of the God who created that son? He says, let there be light, and there was. And we think we have the right to question God when our life isn't all perfect. We want all of our questions answered, and God says, it's beyond your understanding. You know the translation there? He's not trying to be rude. He's saying, why don't you trust me? I'm smarter than you, and hopefully I just proved that to you. Why don't you trust me? Why don't you put your faith in me? You see, faith is not something. It does grow. But that first instant of faith you're either all in or you're all out. It's not like you get to dip your toe into this thing and say, you know, I'll try the Jesus thing for a while and see if it works out. It doesn't work like that. You either say, I believe that God exists and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And if He is who He says He is, who better to place my life in Him? That's what God requires for faith. And we've been hearing, and I've been hearing all throughout the church world, all these different messages that are, in my opinion, false. There's no commitment on our part to live a holy life. That is completely false. James says faith without works is what? Dead. If you're dead, you're dead. I want to be alive in Christ. I want to be dead to sin and alive in Christ. God has the power to do that in your life. But some of you just don't believe it. You don't believe God can do that for you. I'm hopeless. I'm telling you this morning that you are not hopeless. God can change your life. He can set you apart. He has a purpose for your life. He wants to do something in your life. But he says, I won't jump in until you jump first. And he is a gentleman above all gentlemen. And you'll take that first step. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big step. Because you probably can't see the, where it's going to land. God says, take that step and I'll, I'll fill in the gap. Let me ask you a question. Have you placed your faith in Christ? Truly placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Not in anything that you have done, but in what He has done. If you haven't, He's speaking to you this, this morning. Back to Samson, verse 24. Finally, I told you I'm not going to be able to get his whole life in here. <laughs> he hasn't even been born yet. All right, verse 24. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And so Samson has been set apart for God's purpose. He's born into this world to save the nation of Israel and the Lord blessed him. I like that. I want to be blessed. The Lord blessed him. Samson starts his life with blessings. He starts his life with purpose. And you would think that he would live this perfect life. But you know the story. We know the story. Problems will plague Samson's life. He has some faulty character traits that he doesn't allow God access to change. Character traits that hinder Samson's spiritual walk with God. They are the same character traits that hinder many of you. So let's talk about them. 
Number one, compromise. Compromise. Samson compromised God's commands. He broke all three provisions of that Nazarite vow, and I don't have time to cover every single one of them, but let me just do one. Verse 6 of chapter 14. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Verse 8. Sometime later when he went back to marry, he's going to marry this, this Philistine lady, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He, verse 9, he scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. And God has commanded Solomon, uh, Samson, he knows that he is not to touch this dead body. He's not to touch anything unclean. A dead lion, a dead lion's carcass would have been unclean. He would have known that. And yet Samson was willing to compromise his vow to God to fill his belly with some honey. To you and I, that probably sounds pretty crazy. But he was willing to do that. And the truth of the matter is, we compromise. There is compromise in your life. I had a discussion this week about the issue of pornography. It's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt anybody. What's the big deal about it? Everybody's doing it. I'm not doing it. And I know men in here who are not doing it. You can't compromise. It will destroy your life. Get quiet in here. Ladies, lest you think you're <laughs> safe, I go to the hospital and that's about the only time I get to see TV. And I use, sometimes it's in the afternoon when they got those soap operas on. I don't know what you guys are watching. I hope you're not watching that stuff because that's not a soap opera like it used to be. I can tell you that. I mean, it's terrible. Don't compromise. You know, the government, they don't know how to spend my tax money. So I just claim my dog as a dependent. I don't, I don't, that's the best I could come up with. I don't know how to cheat on the taxes. The, the, the machine does it for you, so I don't know. Samson was willing to compromise. And because he was willing to compromise, he lost the blessing of God. And the same will happen in your life. You will not get away with that. You will reap what you sow. And if you compromise, you might get away with it for a little while, but eventually it's going to catch up and it's going to be a disaster. Number two, I got to hurry. Lord have mercy, I do have to hurry. <coughs> Sorry. Impulsiveness. In chapter 14, Samson becomes infatuated with a Philistine girl. Anybody see a problem with that? They're the enemy. What is he doing hanging out with Philistine girls to begin with? Let's look at it real quick. Verse 1, chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah, and now get her for me as my wife. Really? Verse 3, I got a feeling there's been some of that discussion with some of the teenagers. Never mind, let's move on. Verse 3, his father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? And look, 
there's a whole lot in there that I can't even deal with today. Mom and dad, put your foot down. Come on. All right. Samson understood what God had said. He knew that he was not supposed to be unequally yoked. He wasn't supposed to marry somebody outside of the Israelite faith. He knew that. He knew it was wrong, but he was impulsive. He wanted this woman. He had to have this woman. It didn't matter if she is a Philistine. Do I need to even explain that one? Don't be so impulsive. Don't come to my office and say, well, I've known him for three days. We're going to get married. I don't think that's a good idea just yet. I think that's a little impulsive. Let's get to know her. Let's get to know him a little bit. Let's find out where he goes to church at. Let's see if he even goes to church. Is he a Christian? Is he not? There's all kinds of questions in all of that. But Samson is driven by his lust, his stomach, his anger, and it gets him into trouble. There is this idea where, where he goes and he, he's going to get married to this family. They, they decide they're going to do it. And so he decides he's going to have a bachelor party. And I don't understand how all of this works, but his bachelor party, instead of having Israelites at the bachelor party, he has Philistines at the bachelor He's inviting the enemies to his party. And he comes up with this riddle. And they can't figure it out. And they, they are mad. And so they go to his Philistine wife-to-be and they say, look, tell us the answer to the riddle. She says, I don't know it. You better find out because if you don't, we're going to burn your father's house down. We're going to burn your house down. And what does she do? She goes to Samson and she does the number one thing. She cries like a baby. And you ladies know that when you cry, we're, we're, <laughs> it's, it's over for us. We don't know what to do. And he gives in. He tells her the secret. She tells them. And the marriage is off to a great start. Isn't that wonderful? Verse 17, she cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her, because she continued to press him, she in turn explained the riddle to her people. Verse 18, before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than the lion? Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. All right, gentlemen. This is completely off target here with what I've been trying to tell you, but just I need to cover this just in case it comes up. Rule number one, don't let any other person, other man, plow with your wife. And number two, never call your wife a heifer. <laughs> it's just bad, bad husband, okay? All right. That's why that's in there. I wanted to cover that. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question, though, getting back to the story. What drives your decision-making? Is it your self-interest, what's going to please you, or is it what pleases God? And too many times we get impulsive. And we make the wrong choice based on what we want rather than what God wants. Number three, pride. Everything in Samson's life is about him. If you begin to read this chapters, all through these chapters, Samson, you, when he begins to talk, when he has these words, it's I and me and my. It's all about Samson. He is a prideful man. He is so proud, he never thought he would lose his strength he never gives glory to God for all the accomplishments that he does do, and he felt entitled to use God's blessings for his own purposes. And that's a whole other sermon right in there. There's three points to go. I don't have time. Let me ask you, what about you? Do you use the blessings of God, the blessings that he has given you to direct attention to yourself or to God? Are you using your spiritual gifts for God's purpose or for your own desires? Samson allowed compromise, impulsiveness, and pride to wreck his life. And if you think about this, Samson's life started out so well. There was this, this miraculous birth. His, his mother was not supposed to have a child. 
And there were these all high expectations of what Samson was going to do. And yet Samson never fulfilled the plan that God had for him. Why? Because he never truly allowed God to have total control of his life. Can I tell you this morning, God wants to do a work in your life. He wants to do something so radical in your life that you could take no credit for it. That only he would receive credit for it. But you must surrender your life to him. It's got to be you taking that first step. Let me ask you, what would your life look like if you, instead of saying, I want it, you say, I want God more than anything else in my life? I want God more than anything. Instead of saying, I deserve it, you confess to God, I deserve death. And everything past death and, and, and hell is a bonus to realize that you're not entitled to anything. Only God can give you what you need. Instead of saying, my strength, my talents, my abilities, it's all about me, you say, Jesus, it's all about you. It's all from you and through you and for you. Instead of saying, I can handle it, I can take care of this, you say, I can't handle it anymore. Without you, God, I cannot handle it, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see the difference? Give him the door, that's fine. I'm almost done. Lunch is not quite ready. Let me tell you, if you're willing to surrender to him, he's willing. He is able. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And I just happen to be a believer of that book. And I believe all the truth that I need is in that book. So how does that happen? I'll give you this one verse. You probably know it. 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. And we kind of stop there sometimes because that's about as much as we can memorize. But that verse also says, and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see the two things? Not only does He forgive us of our sins, but He purifies us from all unrighteousness. And some will say, that's just positional, that can't be true. Well, when you begin to break it down, do a little study on it, you'll find that that verb is an active verb. It's an action verb. There is something happening there. And God has the ability to change your life. And the reason I know that is because He changed my life. But beyond that, I have watched. I have watched this congregation. And I could point them out, but I'm not going to do it this morning because they wouldn't like it. But they're, they're, I see the actual change that has taken place in people's lives. Where they were when they first came to this church, where their life was changed as they gave their life to Christ, and now they are growing and growing and growing, and God is, is, is shaping them into the image of Jesus Christ. That is available to every single person. You got to believe that, and then you got to surrender. It's not that hard, but it is hard because we want our own way. God wants to change your life. Let's pray. Father, my voice is gone. We've gone long in, this, in the whole thing, Lord. I, I just pray, Lord, that you would not allow your words, your story of Samson, to get away from our hearts and our minds today. Samson had everything to live for because he wanted to do it on his own. Without you, he messed it up. That doesn't have to be our story. And I pray, Lord, that there would be some today that would commit their life to you totally. Whatever you ask, Lord. I think of this group going to the Dominican. They're surrendered to do your will. They will face difficult times over there. 
But I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit would work within them. and They would overcome, not by their power, but by yours. I pray that for every single person in this congregation, Lord, that they would understand who you truly are. And while you say you are beyond understanding, and I understand that idea, Lord, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand you, to know you more today than we did yesterday. And in so doing, Lord, that we would surrender more and more to you, that every ounce of our body, our mind, our soul would be given over to you, that you might be glorified in and through us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.